بسم الله بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا. So last week, um, for those who were here uh, and those who were not, just to recap, we started to introduce kind of a little bit more insight onto theological understandings of God within Islamic doctrine. And if you remember two weeks ago when we had met, we would said there was three foundational theologies that make one Muslim. There is a belief in one God, right? A very pure monotheism. And there is a belief in an afterlife uh, and a belief in the finality of the prophethood and the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And in that first class, we also talked about a short chapter in the Quran that's called Surah Al-Ikhlas, a uh, chapter titled Sincerity. And within it, there was essentially a breakdown of how you can understand the essential kind of understandings of the divine within Islamic tradition, right? Because quite often we get into a place where it says, well, there's other monotheistic religions what makes God different in Islam from the way God is conceptualized in other faith communities? And the knowledge of God within Islam is a negative knowledge, right? That who we understand God to be in Islam is by understanding what he is not. There's a verse in the Quran that says, Laysa kemithlihi shay. There's not anything that's like a likeness to him. So whatever we understand God to be, we know that he is other than that. And in that chapter, one of the ways that God is identified is uh, by the quality of being Ahad. Right? Can anybody tell me what were some of the descriptions of Ahad that we talked about last week or the week before? Or even if you don't, if you weren't here, if you have any ideas. Like it, it translates as like one or the only one, but what does that mean? Any anyone remember? Yeah, go ahead. Indivisible. Word Indivisible, right? So Ahad denotes the idea that you can't break down into parts, right? The way we can remove the camera from the tripod and the tripod is made up of various pieces and bolts, plastics, metals, etc. Ahad denotes indivisibility, right? What else from Ahad? Anything? Yeah. Like absolute. Absolute. Right, meaning unique in its absolute, right? That that idea that God is the one is the only one, you know, in his uniqueness, right? And when that is now put in a complementary understanding of the rest of these divine names we talk about, you know, Rahman we talked about last time, compassionate, Rahim, merciful, but understanding that through this prism of uniqueness absoluteness and they're not seen separately but kind of all together so to speak anything else from Ahad people remember you can't like pluralize Ahad right Ahad isn't something that has like this idea of multiplicity to it right it's very unique oneness in Islam as a tradition so very pure monotheism there's no anthropomorphism in Islam Right? Um, the idea is that God being Ahad, Allah being Ahad, and then it relates now to a second divine quality that we talked about of Samad that gets translated quite often as like a source of refuge, eternal refuge. But what did we say? Anything that came to mind? The relationship between Ahad and Samad? People remember. So one of the things the Quran does stylistically, it's okay, I know I talk a lot, so it's better to just kind of recap. Quite often what you'll find in the Quran is when there's two divine names of Allah mentioned, the first usually is giving an understanding of an essential quality of God, right? This is who God is. He is Ahad. And then the second is how he relates to his creation. He is Samad, right? So he's unique. And he is some of the source of eternal refuge because you want to turn to the one that is unique in his absoluteness, right? That 
the divine is not like anything in creation. And so when you have need, you are in a place of tribulation. You are in a place where you're trying to find comfort and solace. You ultimately are in a place where you turn to Aslamad, because he's a source of refuge, right? Because as an entity, we understand the divine to be without any flaws, any kind of limitations, the way we understand kind of human um, limitations to be. And then the last verse, Lam Yalid wa Lam Yulad, that uh, he is not begotten nor does he beget, right? Introduces again like a recognition of what does oneness mean here, you know? Um, and how do we understand that as many of us come from different faith communities perhaps or families of different faith traditions in your lineage, right? And it's very interesting because in the beginning of Islam, everyone was a convert and then there was very few who were born into it in that first generation, right? Because um, nobody was Muslim until they became Muslim in the beginning. Everyone converted into it. And you had the default norm was like, everyone's a convert. And then it was like, oh, you had a baby, right? So they're now born into a Muslim family. And now you kind of have the opposite, so to speak. But there's still like so many converts to Islam every day, including many of you or those of you who are exploring or thinking about it, as well as those of you who are born into it, but you're trying to reconnect at some level. Here, the idea is just very clear. An Islamic understanding of the divine does not anthropomorphize God in any capacity. So many religious traditions, and this chapter was in specific, kind of in conversation with individuals who are comparing their understanding of God to what the Prophet Muhammad was now teaching them and giving answers where they said, our God has daughters. And in Islam, God does not have any children, right? And the idea that a God would have children also then assumes that the children having divine qualities were birthed. But in Islam, the ultimate source of kind of causation is Allah that everything has a necessary action to which there is reaction to it. There's a cause to everything that comes into existence, but there's an initial point of origin that is now the first, that is what we understand Allah to be. That there has to be something that put it all into motion by principles of logic. That there can't just be something from nothing, so to speak. That there needs to be now a logical understanding that all of it had to have a beginning point and that beginning point could not have also a cause that began it. Does that make sense, right? And there's nothing that's kufu to him like an equivalent, right? God is absolute, as you said. This is important because we want to think about this as we build like a real understanding that's not just abstract, but the whole idea with religion is that it's meant to be acted upon and it should be a source of comfort, not a source of like walking on eggshells, right? It's not that you're like being tested, you know, like, oh, you're trying to be Muslim, right? Tell me all of these five, six hundred million things about things. You're like, bro, I converted five minutes ago. Like, <laughs> how am I supposed to know this, right? You know, you go at a pace, and you have that intimate relationship with God because he is unique, he is Ahad. And so his compassionate mercy, his love, his gentleness is not like any gentleness you've ever experienced. His love for you is not like any love you've ever experienced. He's just looking to embrace and not just watching, but watching over. One of the things that I asked you all to do was between last week and this week to think about a few different things. One, like where did you see mercy in the world, right? We talked about Rahma, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, and for those who missed it, most merciful, the most compassionate. This is how God introduces himself to the reader of the Quran, right? The way we had you all introduce yourselves to one another and you told people your names and you said something about yourself. 
right? This is who I am. This is what I do, you know, right? What did you say when you introduced yourself, any of you, to anybody? What did you, how did you introduce yourself? We just checked in. I was like, we talked about the week. I was like, yeah, I'm a teacher. This is on my day one teaching. Great, right? And you guys already knew each other's names from before, right? Yeah. How about you two? Did you? Start off names. Yeah. It's pretty, it's like straightforward stuff. This is what Allah does in the Quran, right? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, the most merciful, the most compassionate. The way you introduce yourself and give an understanding of this is who I am, the very first thing Allah is telling you when you open the Quran is, I'm the most merciful, I'm the most compassionate. But Rahma is rooted in not just mercy the way we understand in systems of justice, law, etc. But Rahma denotes compassion, softness, it has its own unique love, as well as mercy. And so what I asked people to do last week was a couple of things, because you want to think about how these things actualize around you, right? So for anybody who did it, can you share with us anything that you saw of that kind of mercy in the world in the last week? And I think the other part that I asked was how you yourself might introduce it into the world, right? Was something that we said. Does anybody want to share? Anybody see anything? Yeah. I, I often go to a cafe regularly and last week I thought about it. Um, there's this old elderly couple that comes, uh, they come quite often too, I guess they live nearby. And uh, the lady, the wife, she seems, I guess, she has some, uh, I don't know, uh, Alzheimer's or something and she she's not totally, uh, you know, present and she seems, uh, very helpless and her husband he's also very old and they come in very slowly and it really it, it touches my heart how much the husband cares for her mm. and I saw her he would uh, make her sit down and help her and he could clear, clean the table for her and his, he could barely move his own hand it was fumbling but he cleaned the table for her and just uh, there was so much love in his actions the way he talked to her and even though I felt that she couldn't really connect with him, she couldn't really understand him. Or Go ahead. <laughs> so Are you okay? <laughs> no, I thought I was gonna spill it. No, I think she fell at this point. The drink got this. <laughs> no, no. Sorry. No, it wasn't you. It was more she, uh, never mind, that's okay. Go ahead. Yeah. So, yeah. so that that really touches me uh, whenever I see them. Um, there's this old man, he can barely take care of himself, but he's constantly looking out for his wife. Yeah, and do you see how that's Rahma? Yeah. I think you might have asked last time, right, about how mercy is just related to justice. But do you see how mercy can have nothing to do with justice? Do you see what I mean? That's why you have to like pay attention to the things around you. Right? Not in a creepy way where you're like just staring at people, you know, but in a way where you're able to cast meaning from the world around you. This is what spirituality is in Islam. It's rooted in vision and it's about being able to take comprehension from the environment that you're situated in. Right? And that's a beautiful example of Rahma, of mercy. Yeah, go ahead. Can mercy inhibit justice? Can it inhibit justice? I think it depends on where and how it's being called into action. I work with a lot of survivors of abuse, for example, and I think the unfortunate reality is that quite often where forgiveness is a right and not a responsibility, people will manipulate religion and say that it's more important for you to be merciful and essentially what they're saying is you got to put up with people's nonsense that no person should. And this is where it's a challenge, where quite often we work in places where we make people go away from what is most innate and what is really best for them under the guise of religion, right? Um, and I would say that's a skewed understanding of what mercy actually means, do you know? Uh, does that make sense? So I think in certain instances, rhetoric can create uh, very kind of paralyzing understandings of religion 
that become devoid of realities um, and devoid of empathy, unfortunately, you know? Yeah. Um, justice in Islam also, and we'll talk about this in a few weeks, when we talk about a divine name that is Al-Adl, right, that Allah is most just. But justice in Islam is about restoring balance. And a theological standpoint in Islam, an afterlife, incorporates within it a belief in a day of judgment that is a day where everything is made balanced. That all the questions of why are answered. You know, and a lot of this world doesn't make any sense without this kind of understanding of something that comes thereafter. When you have this kind of understanding that this finite existence is it, it's very easy to then adopt an attitude that's nihilistic, you know? What's the point of all of this? But what the Quran teaches us is that the goat that has no horns will have recompense in relation to the goat that had horns, right? Like everything in creation is going to have balance restored on that day. That's why there's kind of mindfulness and recognition, um, you know, in those ways, right? And people are going to be taken into account in front of God. When we talk today, we're going to talk about um, the divine names Al-Malik and Al-Malik, which if you know the first chapter of the Quran, Surah Fatiha, um, after God identifies himself as Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, he says Malik Yawm Deen, the uh, owner of the Day of Judgment, right? In a different recitation, it says Malik Yawm Deen, right? The king of the Day of Judgment. But the divine will on the Day of Judgment proclaim, like, where is everybody who said they had dominion over others? Those who said they had power over others? And let them come and stand in front of me and essentially challenging the notion that anyone in this world actually can exert that kind of authority over someone else, right? That's why there's delicacy and, and a need to recognize accountability, which didn't exist in the Meccan society. Meccan society didn't believe in an afterlife. They had a theology that said this world is it. And when you don't think there's any consequence to behavior, it's a lot easier to be racist, to be xenophobic, to be sexist, to mistreat people, to do all kinds of things, because you're like, well, I have power, I have wealth, I have affluence, I have privilege, nobody can do anything to me, and at the end of all of this, there's nothing. But what Islam says is no, like, there's an entire eternity after this, and it gets attached now to these notions of some of the things that we're talking about. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any other examples of rahma, mercy you saw? Yeah, yeah. One of the things, um, you know, that might not be the first, second, or third thing you think of sometimes is the mercy that you um, should or supposed to, or um, the opportunity for it with aging parents. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is, and that youth is a privilege. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, however much gratitude we try to exercise or feel, it's, it's never enough. And one of the tests of that or the examples is when you see your aging parents, and that's, you know, when you're midlife and you've got your aging parents where they may seem or appear as if, they have capacity, they are mobile, they're functioning, but things are not the same, and it's a slow progression, um, or downward, I guess, you know, kind of direction, where things are slowly diminishing. So it's everything, it's not always, you know, a on and off button, but it's, it's the, one of the greatest tests of mercy that you have to exercise towards your aging parents who may say things that um, are not the nicest, or may make decisions that aren't the most sensible, but you have to really tap into your deepest yeah, uh, pieces of mercy Amazing. to have patience. And when we talk about wudu today and washing up, it will make like real difficult sense if you are trying to now figure out why do I need to rinse my feet in this way if there's not an understanding of the fundamental divine being that you are seeking to connect through through these spiritual practices and exercises then it just becomes burdensome obligation and ritual and then people who struggle with it because they're not thinking about ar-Rahman and ar-Rahim they either become dejected I'm not good for this or it's not good for me people weaponize and like you suck at this right or you get to a place where it just over time you're like you know it's not that big a deal these like externals, they're not important. 
It's because the importance haven't been attached to what is the foundation, it's the internal. It's not about just the outward. The outward is about what's going on inside, right? And I'm saying this to you just so you could think, if you smile because of this child, that means your heart is like wakeful, you know? And that's good, right? If you're in this place where like your head moves here and there, when the child is running around you, it's because it's good to be distracted by beauty. You see what I mean? And all I'm saying is in between, go and find like beauty and mercy in the world. Cause how nice, you weren't even there when the kid did this thing, right? But how many of you said when you heard the story, oh, right? That's what beauty does. You can hear it secondhand and it's still something that creates energy. Does that make sense? Okay. I want you to try between this week and next week again, right? Because for me, I'm not going to approach this the way you might find in other places. I'm just going to give you a laundry list of things and then you go and memorize it. That's not going to work, you know? You have to understand fundamentally what the religion is trying to do is trying to connect you to the creator of all creation. That's what Islam is doing. And that's not just abstract rote memorization. It has to be experiential. It has to be lived. We'll go back at the end, if we have time, to talk about Al-Malik, Al-Malik, Al-Malik. These are divine names that have this root, Malaka, which denotes like ownership, dominion, things like that, if we have time. But we want to talk now about like wudu, um, which is the washing that we do before we pray. How many people are familiar with this as a practice? Like you've heard about it before, the ritual washing that we have before we pray. Great. How many people know how to do it or think they know how to do it? Yeah, good. Okay, so we're gonna go through it anyway. One of the etiquettes of learning in Islam is revision is really important, right? If you remember last week, I gave you an example where the grandchildren of the Prophet of God saw an older companion of the Prophet who was learning Islam from the Prophet and they saw that he was making a mistake in his wudu. So if that person could make a mistake, it's okay that we make mistakes. We learn from them. And likely, sometimes when we get to a place where ritual has the danger of becoming just overtly ritualized, it's like too mechanical, you just become innate and it just keeps happening again and again, and that inner presence doesn't happen. If you can pull up on your phone, the fifth chapter of the Quran is called Al-Ma'idah. And the sixth verse is what we're going to look at tonight. You can just Google Quran 5 colon 6. <laughs> Do people have it? And if you have the translation, that's fine. If you have the Arabic, the transliteration, whatever you have is good. Anybody who has a translation, can you read it out loud? Five, six. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> oh, you who have believed when you rise to perform prayer, wash your faces and your forearms to the elbows and wipe over your heads and wash your feet to the ankles. And if you are in a state of janaba, then purify yourselves. But if you are ill or on a journey, or one of you comes from the place of relieving himself, or you have contacted women and do not find water, then seek clean earth and wipe over your faces and hands with it. Allah does not intend to make difficulty for you, but he intends to purify you and complete his favor upon you, that you may be grateful. Great. So one of the things as you read the Quran and you build a relationship with the Quran, the verses sometimes stylistically will give you indication as to what it is that they're primarily kind of based upon or their purposes. So you have this construct in many verses. The Arabic says, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu, O people of Iman, people of faith. Right? The word Iman we talked about means faith in Arabic. And this construct at the beginning of a verse quite often is indicating that the content of the verse is in specific 
mentioning something that's relevant to people who are Muslims and is going to likely incorporate something that Muslims are supposed to do. What is this verse telling you that a Muslim is supposed to do? It's not a trick question. Huh? Yeah, but what is it literally saying? Huh? No, no, just what does it you can repeat what it says. Wipe your head, wash your face. Yeah, it's telling you, like, wash your face, do this, do that, right? So, one of the things you want to think when you're reading the Qur'an, you're going to come across these verses, and you want to start to be able to build a relationship with just the style of the Qur'an, what it's doing. Verses that start like this or talk about concepts like this, they are pretty much all revealed after the Muslims move to the city of Medina. So in Mecca, they're there for 13 years and they're living under persecution. They don't have like an established community. And you get to a place now where the last decade of the Prophet Muhammad's life, he has this city that's now called Medina. Then it was called Yathrib and they m migrate to Medina and they can establish a community. The first mosque is built there, practices are given, ritual is given. This one now is something that you want to think out and briefly what I want to do is give you some insight that when somebody was trying to extrapolate from the Quran what they would do and why, when you read it, you have a relationship with it, but you understand that there's more nuance when we're trying to draw practice from it. So when you read this verse, and it says to you, uh, in Arabic it says, فَغْسِلُوا وُجُوهَكُمْ That you wash your faces, right? If I asked every one of you, what makes your face your face? Like, what part of your face is your face? Right? It's not a trick question. And I said write it down so we didn't hear everyone's answers. Some of you would say something different, right? What do you think is your face? Forehead to my chin. Forehead to your chin. Are my ears on my face? They're not on my face? What are they on? They're on my head? Yeah? Is this part of my face my face? Is this part of my head, my face? Yeah? It is? What are you pointing to? This is my, wait, right here. <laughs> See this? Neck, 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 neck area? Is under here. Yeah, what's your beard's under here? How long, oh, okay. to what part of, like, the edges, the perimeter, does the face extend? Where does it stop? What do you think? Over here. I don't know. The face stops at the Adam's apple? No, man, that's... that's right. I don't know about that. Huh? The jawline? Yeah, what do you think? It's not a trick question, just what are your answers? Huh? Your mouth. Your mouth? Your face stops at your mouth? Where does it start then if it stops there? Your forehead. Your forehead to your mouth. Oh, to your chin. To your chin. But what about going this way? Little things here. Right here? Yeah. Stop at the, the little thing. This is what people did when they were looking at the Quran and they were trying to determine what to do. This is why like a literalist understanding of Quran is a challenge at times. Because we're working through translations that even in English, when we're saying what is actually the face, you're like, when has anybody even cared about this? Right? But for the person who is now telling you how to worship God, they're taking it seriously in a different way. Because for them, the mechanics are part of a spiritual exercise that when performed with efficiency and proximity as best as possible to what we understand God wants from us, it directly relates to the highest level of spiritual ascension, right? Meaning, if in your spiritual journey, anybody ever tells you it's not really that big a deal, the mechanics, they're wrong. 
They shouldn't make you feel bad if you're struggling with it and learning it. But if they tell you that's not really that serious, that's not that big a deal. On the other end of it, it's not something to become like hyper kind of scrutinizing to a point where you're self-deprecating. But it's just like any exercise, right? If I stand and I try to lift weights and my form is wrong, I'm not going to yield the same capacity as if my form was correct. In the same way a trainer is going to tell you, like, that's completely off, you know? If you have never gone to a physical therapist and you go to a physical therapist, they will, like, say to you things like, you don't even know how to walk right, <laughs> you know? You, like, are so terrible at walking on your feet. you be like, what you mean, man? I'm a 40-year-old man. I've been walking. They're like, you know that pain you have in your back? is because you don't know how to walk on your toes. And then they try to teach you how to walk on your toes. And they're telling you things about your body that you never even thought about, like, that's how you're supposed to walk? That's what this means? That's what the jurists are doing. They want to ensure that the way you do it actually yields what it's intended to yield. And so they'll sit and they'll look at a verse like this and they'll say, okay, like, what do we understand the face to be? Is it something that is only like what is immediately visible? Does it extend to the outer rims of one's earlobes? Does it stop where the ear starts? Does it go like under the chin or is it just, you know, to the tip of the chin? And you would say, well, why do they do this? Because they're trying to honor a trust between them and God saying that we're responsible for the way these people practice this religion. And Islam as a religion is unique in that it claims that nothing in its text has actually changed since it was revealed. And there's no human contribution to the text. Academics will tell you that the text exists in its original form and there's nothing that has been added to it. Whether you believe it's divine in its base or not, that's a subjective conviction. But across the board, people who are not Muslim will tell you the book exists in its original form. And the idea is that these are time-tested practices that are given now, Muslims believe, from God to creation in ways that create an opportunity to worship that are transformational of the self. So they want to get it right. What else we draw from this is if you remember, we talked about a few different things in one of the first classes that were like categories that all acts can get put into in Islam. And there's two broader terms we want to introduce to you now. There's a word in Islam that's called ibadah. This means worship, like generic worship. The first week, we talked about the word abd. It's got the same root. The word abd means servant, but essentially an abd is something that relies on something else to exist. So everything in creation is considered an abd because nothing in creation is self-sufficient. And God uniquely is rab, like our Lord, because he is self-sufficient. He does not rely on anything for his existence. And so the Abd does the Ibadah, like the servant engages in servitude. And there's acts of worship. This is like one genre of how Muslims engage kind of day-to-day -day interactions. And then there's another category that in Arabic is called Mu'amalat, And this is like everything else, right? So you're not like praying all the time, right? You're not always doing pilgrimage. You're not always engaged in like fasting. You know, there's so much else that you do, how you interact with the world, how you interact with people around you. And these categories to recap that these things fit into are at a base level Five. 
Does anybody remember any of them? Haram. Everybody knows the word haram. <laughs> Amazing. Wajib. Huh? Wajib. Wajib. Well, let's start with haram. Who said haram? Yeah. What does haram mean? Not permissible. Yeah. Right? So strictly prohibited. In Arabic, haram. And this is really hard for a lot of people when you're born into Islam or you're a convert because everybody's just like haram, 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 right? And you just sometimes just got to learn to smile and nod at people and, you know, like, let them be. Do you know what I mean? For something to be strictly prohibited, we said that the evidence for it like what the Qur'an says or what the Prophet said or the different sources of things that we'll reiterate in the coming weeks. But the text has to be decisive, concrete. And the meaning also has to be concise. Can't be probabilistic. So don't eat pork is strictly prohibited because the Qur'an says don't eat pork. That's it. The text is definitive and the meaning is definitive. See what I mean? Make sense? What's on the other end over here? People remember? Wajib. Yeah, so you have the words wajib and fard. People use these interchangeably. And this means obligatory. This verse is going to give us things that are obligatory and is also the evidence of the act of wudu being obligatory. So somebody says, how do you know that Muslims are supposed to wash up before they go to pray? What did that verse just tell you that you just read and I just read, right? And it tells you now that this is what you do when you go to pray and other conditions that we'll talk about in the coming weeks. I'm not going to go into marathon. In the middle, you have acts that are neutral and just permissible. In Arabic, this is called mubah. Here you have things that are disliked. Very good. It's called makruh. And here you have things that are recommended. And this is called mustahab. And then we have another category that are prophetic recommendations. And that's called sunnah mu'akkadah, right? And we'll come to that. So when you look at this chapter's verse, somebody read it again. What does it say? Chapter 5, verse 6. Hmm? Yeah, go for it. Uh, you who believe uh, when you're about to pray, wash your faces and your hands and okay. your arms at your elbows. Yeah, so stop piece by piece. So wash your faces, right? It's the first thing that it says, right? So when people are now determining what goes into wudu, and you read a book that is a thick text, it's going to say, these are the obligations of the practice, these are the recommendations, these are things that are disliked, these are things that are impermissible. Potentially. There's not like so much in the wudu, because, you know. But we're going to see through this verse, like, why it's important to know these things. And I'm going to give you some practical examples. And if we have time, we'll actually like go through like the washing in and of itself. So it tells you like parts to this now. It doesn't only become the evidence that wudu is an obligation, but it tells you the parts that are obligatory as well. Yeah? So before we do that, just to run through it really quickly, 
If I erase this, is that okay? Yeah. Are people with me? Any questions? You have a question? No, I'm not picture. You're gonna take a picture? Hey man, there's no shame in learning. <laughs> Thank you. You should always be proud of doing what you need to do. I forgot this book that I was gonna bring today that is my son's and my daughter's from when they were little. It's called My First Wudu Book. It's like a book that like you can get wet. You know, it's like a little kid's book. But it's got pictures of all your body parts that you wash and these things. Yeah. Oh man. Like you're saying that these are like different categories in which people classify actions. And like for example, Mahmoud is being like, oh, generally just like, but it's not like doubtless. Something is makru if the text or the meaning is probabilistic and the other in that scenario is definitive, right? So you can't say definitively that both are like what we call qat'i. So, so then what is meant in that That in this there's no doubt as a book? Well, let's talk about that. I don't want to throw people off in terms of wudu, but we'll come back to it. It's okay. It's a good question, right? So here, where we have now different parts to wudu, how do you do wudu for people who know? Yeah. You start with your intention. You make an intention. Great. And then what do you do? Uh, you, sorry, you wash your hands, your right hand first, three times. Okay. Can people see the orange? Yeah. yeah. No? Okay. Hands, and then what? Oh, your mouth? Hands and mouth. Anybody else want to keep going? After... Mouth and nose. So, hands. Mouth, nose, face, face, uh, arms up to the elbow, including hands too, right? Mm -hmm. Wipe the head, ears. wipe the ears, feet and ankles. Shouldn't there be another intention? Yeah, shouldn't you say between the nose and the face? Huh? Shouldn't there be an intention between the nose and the face? I'm just gonna write down whatever you say. So between the nose and the face, another intention? Well, I guess the, the with the first obligatory act, the intention should be there, right? Okay. Anything else we want to add on to here before we start to break it down? Yeah. Okay. Dua here. Great. So, I'm going to clean this up a bit just so it's like the, the parts to it. Okay? That we can see in the Quran. So, what do we take from the verse? Like, what do you see from here in that verse? Face. And, uh, you see face? Let's see. Let's do this. I'll put an X next to it. Forearms to elbow. Yeah. Head. Head. Feet. Feet to ankles. Hands. And the hands are default because you're washing with your hands, right? What does this not say? Mouth and nose. It doesn't say mouth and nose. What else of what you said is not in that verse? Intention. Intention. Anything else? Like when you make wudu, what are the things you do in wudu? If for those who know. Brush your teeth. You can wipe out your teeth. Yeah. What else? Ears. Ears. But what, what, like the... How many times do you wash things? Oh, three times. Three times. Does it say that in the verse? No. No, right? 
When you are looking at this now, what they would base this on, you have different acts that are considered to be far. So your face, your arms to the elbow, your feet, your head. No head first. I but the order is order. not, the, I'm just writing them down. Oh. Okay. These are like the obligatory things, right? What falls now into the recommended are the order, the number of times, the mouth, and the nose. And then you have these other add-ons like intention and these kinds of things. You see what I mean? You want to do all of it. And we're going to teach you how to do all of it. But sometimes it's going to be necessary to understand what goes into it piecemeal. Because not every situation is going to be that you can go and wash up in a room that is dedicated to making wudu. You know? Most of you don't have wudu rooms in the places that you frequent quite often, right? And most of the places you go, if somebody saw you washing your feet up to the ankles, they'd be like, what is this person doing? <laughs> you see what I mean? I'm supposed to go to Turkey on Monday to do some relief work. And when I land, I am going to take a flight from Istanbul to the more deeply impacted areas where it's snowing, there's rubble, there's a lot of like just kind of devastation. I still have to be able to wash up for prayer in that situation. And I have to have a familiarity that is not something that understands things just at a surface level. For those of you who don't have a relationship with this, you don't want to overexert yourself in the onset. But the idea is to not make things unnecessarily easy for the sake of ease. You do it how it's supposed to be done, but you understand that there's different ways of doing it sometimes, right? The example I like to give, and we'll talk about this in the coming weeks in more detail, but I just want you to familiarize yourself with the base of it. There's different types of water you can make will do with, right? Water is considered to be through two elements, and we'll talk about it in more detail, but just get the words in your head, right? The water has to be pure, as well as purifying for you to make wudu. Two characteristics. Water that has already been used for wudu, for example, is still pure, but you can't reuse it to make wudu. It's no longer purifying. Does that make sense? So, there's different types of water that one can make wudu with and that water can, for example, be like from snow. So I had students who were sledding in Central Park. We have a prayer that comes in at sunset and the window is very small. Sometimes in the calendar year, especially in the winter time when it's snowing, it's that much shorter because the days are so much shorter, right? And they're in the middle of Central Park, surrounded by snow, and they have to figure out how they're going to make wudu. So they called me, and they're like, hey man, like, what do we do? So they use the snow. But how do they use snow to make wudu? And if somebody teaches you to make wudu, where they say, you have to do all of this, and you have to include all of this. And they don't give you an understanding of how it works. And these poor kids are going to be sitting in Central Park. And what are they going to be doing? Like rubbing snow all up and down their body. <laughs> They're going to be taking clumps of snow and sticking it in their mouth and their nose. And then after doing it once, they're going to be like, man, i got to do this three times. <laughs> right? We're like, no, this is the exception. You want to do this 
when the capacity is there and the ease is there, it's still a spiritual exercise. But they are going to just do each thing once. And then we'll talk about also other ways strategically that they can make wudu that doesn't necessitate them having to sub snow down their socks in like sub-zero weather, right? Because when I'm going to Turkey, I'm going to be in a place where I'm going to be in the middle of like a lot of snowfall and it's going to be cold. It'd be very easy for somebody to be like, you just got to do it this way. But if you know what the rules are, you're not finding workarounds. You're understanding how they apply in different situations when necessary. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Does it? Are we sure? Everybody with me? Yeah? What were you going to say? Um, I wanted to say like about like the turkey stuff. Like My mom was like telling us like what happened. And she said that like she wanted to like go to Turkey and like help. <laughs> and like she actually like, she wanted to like go with you. And then she's like, she like tried to like, Mom, you like emailed him, right? She yeah. texted me, yeah, yeah, and I told her. No. But there's a lot of people that, that yeah. asked, right? And that's a beautiful thing. You should want to go to help people in their time of need. Yeah. And one of the reasons why I'm going is so that as a community that I serve, I have to show the people that I serve that it's important to go and be with people in their struggle, right? To not just kind of be in a place where if we have the means, it doesn't mean all of us can go, but I go on behalf of all of you, right? I carry your love, I carry everything that comes, and it's sometimes necessary to recognize that. Do you see what I mean? Right now, they can't take just generic volunteers. If you've never been in like a conflict zone or in the aftermath of natural disaster, they're literally in real time right now building out all of the systems. You know, there's still aftershocks on the ground that are bringing down buildings. Allah make things easy for the people there. Um, and there's so much more that's going on. So every person that kind of responded back to me being like, can I come with you? Can I like, that's beautiful. You should want that desire to come, right? That means that like you really have a connection and that love that's there that's so integral to faith in Islam. But they're going to be in a place where there's liability concerns. There's other things. And they're just not ready right now to have kind of just generic volunteers. But down the line, there's gonna be a necessity for skill sets, like other things. And people forget, right? It's really easy in the aftermath of crisis to be like, yeah, I'm gonna do what I can. But like four months from now, when those people are still trying to figure out how to rebuild stuff, that's when like, you're gonna really see where like love has continuity to it. Do you know what I mean? You're gonna say something else? I just wanted to say like, um it's probably like common, but like I would like keep in like your duas, like Edward in Turkey, just because like it's like like that could happen like to us, and, like, like happen at any time. You never like you never like control it. Yeah, and it's a big part of Islamic theology. When you have an uncertainty of who God is, and you have a discomfort with an uncertainty of what tomorrow could be, the two unfamiliarities they just create chaos inside. I need to always have control. I need to always be the one that is in control. But when you can now yield to a divine entity that you build familiarity with, and then you recognize that I'm not the one that's in control, you know? A friend of mine was in a plane that like dropped substantially in turbulence. And he said, I like freaked out and I grabbed the like armrests and then he said, it was crazy that I was trying to find comfort in the thing that was making me uncomfortable in the first place, right? So the plane was messing with him and he was trying to have the plane holding on to it also bring him ease, right? He said, but the distress was just like complete, utter absence of control, you know? And that really was something he struggled with. You see what I mean? Okay. So... What we want to do over the next week or two is talk about wudu as a practice more concretely. It's spiritual meanings, right? This falls under that category of ibadah. It is a prerequisite to our daily prayer, but it's still its own act of worship. So it's not only a condition for prayer. You see what I mean? Right? You don't want to think about it in a way that is kind of more mechanical 
and that it's in this list of prerequisites, but on its own, it serves a spiritual purpose. And it isn't something that is only engaged in prayer, but it's a necessity in prayer, but still things you want to build a relationship with outside of prayer. We're gonna do a quick kind of rundown of how this functions. Yeah, what's your question? So, I'm um, thinking this question through as I say it out loud. Um, but in terms of, I think, uh, speaking for myself, right, a lot of it, um, I've kind of learned my religion in Islam, especially sometimes put into it, as a very, like, a black and white, right? Like, either you do this, and oftentimes people don't explain it, you just do it, like, perfect it, and move on, right? And like you were saying, the mechanics of it, right? Um, but it, I, besides, you have some kind of foundation, obviously, it, even though it's the very black and white kind of view of it, right? Um, but then there's so much more nuance in it, like you just pointed out, right? And like, you know, in like, you're talking about like disaster zones and stuff like that, when they, you do have limited options of like how to make blue and stuff like that, right? Um, and like the people in Central Park, right? If we don't have an Imam Khali to call up and say, hey, like, what do we do? You can situation? call me whenever you want. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just sitting what around. Do we, how do people find those answers? Don't text right? me. I don't respond to text me. Really well. <laughs> if you call me, I'll pick up the phone. Yeah. <laughs> but um, how do you find those answers? Right? You just try your best in certain situations, right? But you have to have an ongoing process of learning. When you have texts that teach you practice, the way like when you were younger, somebody had to teach you like two plus two equals four, rotely, perhaps even before they taught it to you conceptually, right? So I know two plus two equals four, doesn't mean I understand two plus two equals four, right? But pedagogically, you're given certain skills building up towards something. So if you have a book that's teaching you how to pray, it's because Islam is for everybody and not everybody's going to have the opportunity to engage in something, especially in particular stages of their life. But you'll have a text that's like a primer text and it'll just give you a list. This is what you do. It'll break it down the way we did. Right. And even more, you know, these are things that are disliked. These are things that are like more recommended, etc. But the idea won't be to like walk through it step by step to say this like is what that means tangibly or practically for you necessarily, right? I don't want that to be the case for you because I sit down with people like every week, many people take their shahada here, mashallah, and there's so many more people who are born into Islam where like they don't know like how to distill in certain ways, right? Do you see what I'm saying? And we want to do that differently because we want to learn and some of that's going to be unlearning as we learn. You know? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes. And if you just do it the way that you were taught, mm -hmm. it's still fine, right? Yes. But also, like, you're right. I think, like, obviously, like I said, there's some kind of foundation and some kind of understanding there, right? But you get to a place which is where... Well, then the primer text grows into, like, an intermediate text. The intermediate text goes into an advanced text, right? So there's like a Hanafi text. The Hanafi school is a legal school of thought in Sunni Islam. Um, it's called Ta'lim al Haq, right? It's like a primer text in Hanafi fiqh. It's just going to be a list of like stuff. And then you go, there's a text called Nur al Ida, right? There's a text that's translated into English, uh, Ascent to Felicity. Right, and you then have like an advanced text that's called the Hidayah. That when you read it, it assumes that you read those other books and understood them. Do you know what I mean? But when you get to a place where like it's just by a certain age, I learn certain things, and then the kind of heaviness and busyness of the world tells me there's not more room to engage it. Well, then that's like going to be part of the problem. You see what I mean? Yeah, go ahead. For me, it's usually like if I'm stressed or something, wudu is actually the hardest part. Like just getting up and doing that. I'm like, if I don't have to do wudu, I could pray. 
ironically in my head. But yeah, it's it's a difficult like hurdle to get over. Yeah, it's it's tough. Sometimes like getting off and like hanging out the hot and just putting on my prayer dress and like I just You just what? I just wanna like lay in bed and like like I used to be Christian and you pray however you want and like I could just pray in my my room in my bed. Now there's kind of like a a system like and this is hard, right? For anyone who's in the room who is a convert and can relate in these ways, right? I'm not a convert, you know? I've sat down with thousands of people who've converted. My wife's a convert. Despite having a deep, intimate relationship with someone who's a convert and sitting with people at this pivotal decision in their life, I still couldn't tell you what it's like to actually do it. But I think the advantage of being in a room like this where there's others who, if they want to, like, share personally or give insight, you know, it could be helpful in that way, right? Yeah. I just want to say I'm not a convert. I was born into it, and uh, I think it's a great challenge. It's legitimate. It's valid. Dare I say, God forgive me if I'm saying anything wrong. We're just talking about how we feel, right? And I think what Brother Khaled said is there's just Zulu. I think it's just like a lot of other things where there's a preliminary understanding, there's a struggle, there's a challenge, and you evolve and you grow, and you're not the same all the time in different parts of your life. I can tell you, for me, I was going to ask after the same thing. Um, you know, how do you kind of balance? So there's sort of the, we're trying, we're talking about a balance here of like the literalist kind of perspective where on, on one hand, there is no two ways, right? If the Quran says it, like we just read, it, it's very powerful, right? Straight text from the Quran, it describes with it. So it's kind of one of those things where it's black and white. Not everything is, but that is. So in that way, we can't really dispute it or question it. But at the same time, we acknowledge that sometimes the only thing between you and your prayer is the Buddha. Well, it always is, I guess, the Buddha. But that can be a deterrent. And I, I feel guilty even saying this out loud. But like for my kids, even, you know, they're like, they don't, we don't have to do it. That's we can it. just pray. Right? Not even for adults. Even for adults. So I think, OK, not these kids. But it's a journey. It's a journey. And it's really difficult. But I think that it changes along the path. But to whatever extent it has any value, it's not just a convert issue at all. Like this is all uh, we've seen in our family, um, and it's hard. And it, and sometimes it's not hard for a long time, and then it gets a little hard, and then it's not hard again. You know. So. The acclimation process is going to be rooted in your humanness, right? Like look at the way this country enacts prohibition or emancipation of slaves, right? Slavery is a pre-modern concept, also. And what you find in the Qur'an, as well as in the prophetic tradition, is that when somebody made a mistake, they were told to emancipate a slave, you know? And in this country, when emancipation was proclaimed, not only did it not stop, but an economy was built so much on it that people literally went to war because of it. You see, prohibition is enacted, and people didn't stop. They were now bootlegging and creating, like, more challenges. All over the Muslim community, when it's being revealed Islam, everybody is setting people free, emancipating them, because everybody kept making mistakes, right? And God, as the creator of his creation, understanding how we develop humanly, is in a place where he is now attaching to a mistake, still a noble and necessary act, that fundamentally is breaking down something that's unjust, but giving us an example that like certain things are going to be hard and you're going to struggle and you're going to make mistakes with them. If you go from a place where you have religion that doesn't have the same structure to religion that does, you're going to need to be willing to understand the love of God and how it applies to like self-love and self-forgiveness, not be like hard and difficult. Why people really relish in reading stories of the companions of the Prophet. My brother-in-law is a convert to Islam. And he said he connected very deeply to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But he said reading the stories of the companions as a convert was so helpful to him because he saw people who, in their sheer vulnerability, they were not perfect. They were making mistakes. They were struggling with things. And that's just a part of it. Do you see what I mean? I would love to build opportunity for us to also have individualized conversation where we can look at the specifics that go into your days and your routines and think out how those become applicable here. You were going to say something? 
I, I was just thinking around all this, like, just shame, right? How much is shame just, like, generally um, grafted into society, mm -hmm. you know, in, in so many spaces we inhabit. And, um, you know, part of this, you were, you were talking about last week, the, um, two weeks ago, uh, yeah, j just how much, so, so much of that is, like, learned, right? And from what I'm, I'm gathering, what I'm learning, like, Allah does not want me to feel shame, right? Or, that, like, that, that would not be a, that's what I'm gathering. Like an unhealthy right? like, shame. Like, yeah, right? but, yeah. Do you know like, what I mean? And that's yeah, a beautiful so, thing, right? If there's literally, like, psychologically, cycles of shame that we just live in constantly, you know? And if you have this cycle of shame that is pushing people into different modes of experience, like when somebody is in a place of shame, they can do a bunch of things. They can like blame, they can avoid, right? They can be in a place where they, uh, I'm trying to think of words. Right, like if, if you and I, if you borrowed my car, right? Or I borrowed your car and I drove it down the street and I came back and there was a dent in it, you know? My cycle of shame could have me in a place where like I just give you the keys, I don't say anything, you know? And I just go sit in a room and that's it. My cycle of shame could have me like fight with you. And I could say, well, why did you give me the car in the first place, you know? Or like, it's your fault, you should have driven me, right? I could be in a place where I exist in like these different modes. It's escaping my head now what the other groupings are, but you know what I'm talking about. If you ever argue with someone or had a fight with somebody or somebody blamed you with something, we live in these cycles of shame, but what breaks a cycle of shame is going to be like empathy and love. And this is why this can't be like a fluffy thing. This is why Islam talks about it so much, right? You break cycles of shame through this. All of this has to be connected back to God at the end of the day, right? And if Islam becomes something that many converts experience this, everything is about God, and then you become Muslim, and then nobody talks about God anymore. It's just about the do's and the don'ts and the mechanics of things. Right? People bring like all kinds of people to me. They're like, there's this problem and that problem. My family member this, my kid this, you know, this and that, right? It was like all you gave to them was just the black and white. That's a part of it, but there's so much more to it. You see what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, the, thing, the thing that was in my head was when you were talking about two weeks ago about when it goes from, you know, happenstance or, you know, slip ups to consistency. Right? Yeah. And that intention and self-awareness um, and, and how that would play into our shame as well and, and maybe not uh, fulfilling sort of these guidelines, right, that are laid out for us. And it's so much easier to find the drive to do when there's like positivity behind it, you know, and that intention becomes deep. We'll talk about this more um, next week. I'm sorry, I know every time there's things that I say we're going to do and we kind of are going slow, but I think it's important, right? We want to build kind of a concrete foundation and then you have things and things will come up, but you don't have to jump to name them right away. You let yourself sit on it for a couple of days and then, uh, you know, pay attention back. Like, why did this rise up for me? Between this week and next week, you can just look up how to make will do, right? And then we'll start going through the steps here um, and kind of walking through it. I'm not gonna be here next Wednesday, but um, Khaled and Angie and Solomon, who run our converts group, they're gonna together, like kinda create what is gonna happen here next Wednesday, so definitely come. And when you're thinking about like your wudu, just try to practice it, so that when you're coming, you can think like, okay, what are some of the challenges? And if not next week, two weeks from now, we can think about that on a scenario level, right? Where you wanna say like, okay, it's not that simply here, this is what it says. How do I function as a Muslim like this in a world that is not Muslim, right? Nobody in my firm is Muslim. Nobody in my department is Muslim. Nobody in my place of work is Muslim. They don't do these things. 
but the structures are not built for them, right? The sink in my company bathroom is not something I can literally lift my foot into, you know? We used to have bathrooms here before they made these wudu rooms, right? Where the sinks literally kept breaking and crashing because all these Muslim people are sticking their foot in it and they're putting all their weight on it. Nobody built a sink thinking that some human being was gonna do that, right? And it's just, you think, you've ever been here for Juma before, you know, you think about, it's like 700, 800 people every week, every day, how many people? They're just putting all their body weight. This thing just keeps crashing and crashing. I'm like, hey man, just build some wudu rooms, right? Because we're going to keep doing it, what he wants to do, you know? But when you're in your office place now, you're not an 18-year-old kid who is super entitled and thinks like, well, they should just build another sink for me anyway, right? And you're like, yeah, that's how the world works, you know? <laughs> And you're in your place of work, and it's like, what will these people think of me? You know, how do I do this here? Right? We want to talk about those things in specific, but if you come with the specifics, it'll help us to kind of navigate it with more nuance. Does that make sense? Any questions before we wrap up? I want to make sure we end before nine. Yeah. I just spawned about like the those things that are more nuanced that weren't actually in the thing in the Quran that we read. Is that like hadith or is that like... Those hadith? come from the hadith, right? And they're emphasized practices of the Prophet. So the default is you want to always do every part. You want to follow the order. In Arabic, what we call tartib, right? There's an order to it. There's a reason there's an order to it. The number of times, the inclusion of the mouth and the nose. Um, these are all like sunnah practices, but they are things that like the Prophet would do with regularity. The only reasons where we are seeing that he doesn't do them is to establish that they're not like at the level of obligation, do you know? And there's gonna be instances, right? That there are gonna be certain things that come into play and it's not just like you're going into a natural disaster zone, right? If you're in your place of work, we can help you build strategy as to how you can do this with comfort and it starts to create ease for you and you're not doing anything that's watered down like it's in our religious tradition. You don't have to feel like guilty or bad about it. There's certain things that come, right? When you wash your head, for example, you know, in the Hanafi school, you have a minimum of washing like a fourth of your head. Is the um, In other schools, we won't get into them. It's even less than that. Right, so if you're somebody who wears a scarf in public, for example, I don't know if, if you do or not, but if you do, you know, and you're in this place that's like new, and you're trying to figure out how do I do this, like in this bathroom, I gotta like unravel everything and then like ravel it up again. It's like, no, right? Where there are these mechanisms, you kind of can do things in places that are still fulfilling like the requirements of it, and they diminish the anxiety, which is like a tool of shaitan. He wants you to be stressed when you come to prayer, but like prayer is supposed to bring you like relief, not anxiety. Do you see what I mean? And so we want to workshop these things so we're all on the same page as to how we can do them. Do you get what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Right, so the idea is like, yeah, in a normal routine, you come to this center, there's a wudu room right there, right? Then just get it done. You know, do the whole thing, the order is supposed to be done, the number of times is supposed to be done, and that's a blessing. And it'll be that much better to do it here when you realize like how difficult it is in these other places, you know? But we don't want you to be in a place where the struggle is something that doesn't have to be necessary because we can also give you tools and techniques on how you can do that when you're in these places that weren't built necessarily with an understanding of like what we do and a lot of people are nice right people be like you could pray in this room but they can't convert a sink into like a foot bath you know how would they do that yeah i had a question in regards to what they mean by wash in particular like like this does that involve like like scrubbing or can it be padding something that i've noticed that i've done and sometimes i feel like so bad about it is that whenever i have like Whenever I put in a lot of effort in my makeup, I realize that when I do my face for the wudu, I just do, I tap, but otherwise I would just like really scrub the face. Yeah. So 
So I was wondering if that's a ticket that's... We're going to go through it in detail. The idea with the wudu as principle is that every one of these parts that we listed, water has to touch them in full, right? You don't want to miss parts. So the challenge isn't with makeup in and of itself, but anything that's a potential barrier to any part of one of these parts that we talked about of the, the obligatory parts, right? So say, for example, somebody is wearing Invisalign. Does anybody wear Invisalign? Nobody wears Invisalign. Great. Let's pretend I wear Invisalign. I don't. I got a really crooked tooth, right? But let's say I wore Invisalign. I can theoretically rinse out my mouth and still keep the Invisalign in because the mouth is not from the obligatory parts to it. Do you know? And it wouldn't invalidate the wudu if I did that. Do you see what I mean? But if I am now trying to wash my arm that is explicitly mentioned, like the arm in its entirety, what happens a lot, you know, if we're looking at our arms, is when people make wudu, they're like bringing their arm like this, right? A lot of times, you know, I like put my arm under the sink and my arm is like this, sometimes maybe like this. But when you're doing it like this, quite often, People miss this part because it's folded up, right? The whole arm also has to have water flow over it and in its entirety. So if I'm wearing my beads or a watch, there's a chance that that's going to prevent water from hitting this part. Do you see what I mean? So the challenge isn't with the makeup per se, but the challenge is with the barrier that's preventing the water from hitting the part that it needs to. Do you get what I mean? Does that make sense? Right? I don't wear makeup on my face. Um, I used to do a lot more media, was on TV a lot more, right? Now nobody wants to talk to me, so it doesn't happen as much. But I used to have like a lot of like makeup put on my face in different times. Um, and it was weird because I had my kufi on and they were like trying to powder in different ways and they didn't know like, you know, powder would get on the kufi and they'd be like, what do we do? Like, it was very, uh, it's totally off topic. <laughs> but like, you know, when they would pull this stuff off, they'd give me these wet wipes. And I'm like, man, how much stuff did you put on my face? Like, what, do I look that bad that you had to put all of this stuff on my face? If it's not porous, and it doesn't allow for the water to touch what needs to be touched, then the wudu is not considered to be complete. You know, and this is why I said to you before in the beginning, if somebody tells you it's not that big a deal, this is where they're wrong, right? Because it's not based off of just, I think, I feel, it's a God-centric religion, and it's done in the way that it's said to be done. So for you know men who have thick beards, beards that are long, beards that extend, it's not just a simple washing over their face, you gotta like stick your hands into your beard, get the water into there, right? Because getting this wet doesn't mean that I got like the skin wet. You see what I mean? Does that make sense? And that's where like the thoroughness of it is, right? So if we were to go through it, like you're washing your hands, you wanna interlock your fingers, right? So that water is getting in between like each of the digits. I have to take my rings off when I make wudu, you don't want to leave it to chance. This is a spiritual act, right? You want to remove like everything that has to be done. You're gonna interlock arm hands, right? And as you're walking through things, you think, right? This is what you want to conceptualize when you go home between this week and next week. When I'm like washing different parts, right? What I said to Khaled earlier today, like a lot of people when they wash their face and they go like this, they forget like this part of their face right here. You know, the part that, you know, for me, for example, is between my sideburn and my ear. This is like a part of my face. You know what I mean? But if I'm going like this, you can see, I didn't touch that part of my face, right? And that's mindfulness like requires like an understanding, like, okay, you know, you're doing your feet what we're taught in the same way. You take your left hand and you're gonna put them between each digit 
of your feet, so the water is reaching it. When it says like up to the elbows, it means like up to your elbows. Do you know? When it says up to your ankles, you like go up to your ankles. You see what I mean? Does that make sense? Right? And the presence in it is important. You know? Do you get, does that, does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah? Yeah. Oh, I know we're short on time, but like, I just recently started wearing a hijab and I found like, so I, this is based on what like the comment you said earlier about one of the schools saying like, you can do like one curve of your head. Can you like elaborate on that? Because like, I found like a new challenge, like when I'm trying to like do a do in public. And I'm just like, like you said, like unwrapping and like the undercap off and I'm like, oh, and then you have to put it all yeah. back on. Like you said, one fourth. In the Hanafi school, the base like requirement of your head is a quarter of the head, right? And so you could take like these four fingers and literally like wipe them over a fourth of your head. In the Hanafi school, that suffices. In other schools, there are also like some that it's like even less than that. Do you know? Um, it doesn't mean that that's like the default. You know what I'm saying? I can never know what it's like to wear hijab, right? As a woman. Do you know what I mean? I wear a kufi and you know it's not the same right it's it's just not i make wudu and there's like the number of times i like see guys staring at me and i'm like what are you doing bro and they're like i've never seen you without a kufi on before we didn't know what your head looked like i was like this is it's just what are you talking about what are, you know what i mean it's still not the same do you know what i mean we as religious minorities are constantly put in a place where who we are and how we practice is seen as other, right? People ask me a lot, how are you so articulate? Well, I had to spend like years of my life being the only Muslim in many rooms and a ton of people looking for a reason to say why I don't belong. So I couldn't dress improperly. I had to be the most eloquent because everybody was scrutinizing every word, right? When you put on a scarf, it essentially is in a place where it draws like more attention to you when you're walking down the street and people have different expectations to you that I can't imagine like what that's like. May Allah make it easy. And then you're in a place where you're like, man, I gotta like keep doing this and keep doing that. And other people will tell you like, yeah, this is your jihad, you gotta do it. No man, you're trying to pray to God. You know what I'm saying, right? You don't have to like be the burden of representing every Muslim all the time for their whole world. And that's why we wanna like go through it in these ways. So I'm not just giving you a list and then tell you go figure it out on your own but we can bring like that aspect now that says let's learn from each other's experiences and how in certain settings we're able to engage in what we need to and still speak to like some of the realities that we're facing do you see what i mean does that make sense yeah yeah go ahead um probably just an awkward question um is it possible to complete voodoo in the shower if you have your intention or yeah okay. so you need intention like right that's that's what it is and that's where we'll talk about intention intention is what is a big part of islam when you pray for example our morning prayer there's two sets of two cycles of prayer right and they're prayed exactly the same one categorically is recommended the other is obligatory the only thing that makes them different is the intention that's made when you pray them, right? You can jump in the shower and wash everything because all of that can be done, but you need the express intention. Otherwise, it's just a shower. Do you see what I mean, right? It's important to add that element into it fundamentally. Does that make sense, right? Like, because it's still a spiritual act. Do you know? There's different people who would tell you, like, if the intention's not there, the like wudu is still valid in that way because you've still essentially washed everything and the intention wasn't from the expressed obligations of it you see what i mean but you want to be in the habit where like wherever you are you're making the intention right and that intention can have multiple facets this wudu is an act of worship right i'm intending through this to like worship god right this is a way for me to get you know, to emulate the actions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So I'm intending to follow the sunnah of the Prophet, right? Practicing a sunnah of the Prophet is an act of worship in and of itself, right? And there's so many more that we can kind of bring to it in that way. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Just want to say, another, you know, 
in, in tapping into Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy and compassion, you can sometimes fall down a rabbit hole where it's like, you know what, an imperfect wudu is not going to invalidate my prayer because my intention is good, I'm trying to say my prayer, just like kind of a, if we had to hire, you know, you kind of, you can't help but make a hierarchy, you know, like prayer is the most important, wudu might not be perfect, but at least I'm trying to pray. And it's not quite that simple, right? Like you said, it's an act of worship in itself, and you have, it's important, you've got to get it right. But another way that I've tried, when I struggle to try to think of it, is you're presenting yourself before God. Sure. And so, you know, you go to an interview, or you go to a wedding, or you go, you know, how much effort we put into our presentation, or our, you know, kind of whole um, readiness. So, that with that connection, and that love, um, you know, between the Creator and yourself, that can kind of motivate you also to kind of go forward in your best form, you know. Yeah. That's another way to... And if you find that like you're making a mistake you just remedy the mistake okay i'm gonna stop because i said we'd stop before nine and it's like 8 58. Um, <laughs> we'll still do something next week and it might build off of this but come back next week and try to practice some of these things in between right um the wudu is a spiritual state there's a benefit to just trying to be in wudu as much as you can you know we'll talk about what breaks your will do, why you have to remake it. You don't have to keep doing it before every prayer. You can maintain like one state of will do for the entirety of a day, you know, and we'll talk about some of this, right? Like how our eating habits impact some of these things, our sleeping habits impact some of these things, and where and how we want to see how all of us connects to the rest of us. Um, but come with like also just things like what you just said, right? And I appreciate your vulnerability because it'll help us to map out, you know, scenarios that we can then kind of anticipate and as people are kind of getting deeper in their connection to this it'll help them think out things that they might not be thinking of right okay all right sound like and we'll see everyone on, on, on.